Hello again. Here we are for part two of week two. We're still in Genesis uh, in the second chapter of the Arterbury, Bollinger, and Dodson book. So I hope you're reading along and I hope you're reading through the book of Genesis as well. It's always good. If you haven't read the Bible, it's always good to read it. If nothing else, that has good historical literature or ancient sources of wisdom. So to continue to finish up with our uh, coverage of Genesis, we're now in the ancestral stories. Abram and Sarai are traveling down to Egypt because of a famine. Abram, apparently Sarai was pretty hot, and Abram maybe uh, was a little timid. And so when he sees that the Pharaoh is uh, making eyes at Sarai, he basically lies and says she's my sister, so they won't kill him in order to take her. Uh, as I said in the last video, kind of a punk move. Uh, it's, it doesn't put Abram in the best light, but neither does any of the Old Testament or the New Testament. One thing about the Bible is it doesn't cover up or gloss over human failure. So Yahweh intervenes and gives Pharaoh a dream, warns him not to touch her, and delivers him out of this danger. Apparently, according to the text, doesn't even rebuke Abram for his uh, um, feckless move, shall we say. Abram, Abram travels around Canaan, and uh, he has flocks that are multiplying. He eventually becomes wealthy and uh, has conflicts with his nephew Lot. So they agree to go separate directions and, and split the, their, uh, their, their possessions. Lot goes to live in Sodom on the plain, uh, in, the, in the coastal plains. Abram goes into the mountain country, and we'll probably revisit Lot's story at some later point. But despite the promise of God and the blessing of God, uh, Abram still does not have a child. Apparently, they, uh, have a, they're unable to conceive. That sometimes happens. And so Yahweh rep repeats the promise and confirms it with a covenant custom sacrifice. It may seem a little strange, but you, this is where you begin to need to understand the customs of that time period. Animals are killed and sacrificed that they're cut in two. And a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passes between the pieces. The, the fire and the, the smoke and the flame are symbols of the divine presence, which makes this a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of God when God appears to us. Another custom of the culture, when Sarai continues to be barren out of desperation and frustration, perhaps, she instructs her servant Hagar to have a child with Abram. And so um, Ab Abram apparently didn't object or fight too hard against the idea. And Ishmael is born uh, to Abram through Hagar, the servant of Sarai. According to the customs of the time, uh, that was like having a child by proxy. So since... Uh, Hagar undoubtedly belonged to Sarai. She probably was a personal slave, so her womb belonged to her as well. So she, uh, Sarai borrowed Hagar's womb to have the baby. Chapter 17 repeats the promise, and their names are changed from Abram, which means great father, to Abraham, father of a multitude, and from Sarai to Sarah, which means princess. This chapter also describes a physical sign of the covenant relationship of this family with God, uh, which is a sign of circumcision, which is a, a physical remove, removal of some of the fleshy part of the male organ. And this becomes a sign of co covenant faithfulness or covenant commitment of all the Hebrews to uh, Yahweh. Eventually, Isaac is born to um, Isaac is born to Abraham and Sarah, and of course, unfortunately, Hagar and Ishmael are sent away because they're now 
this family drama is not inconvenient. And God appears to Hagar and promises to take care of her and her son. Tradition has it that Ishmael becomes the father of the Arabic peoples. And uh, uh, the Arabs and is, is Muslims in, in general have, have uh, great respect for Abraham and the Abrahamic story. So Isaac uh, is born, and as he grows, then God ups the ante and pulls a, a pulls a uh, surprise on Abraham Abraham when he asks him to sacrifice Isaac to to God to Yahweh Abraham doesn't has hesitate he packs up a donkey they go into the hills Isaac says where's the sacrifice and Abraham says God will provide and just as Abraham raises his knife to sacrifice Isaac God stops him and provides a ram as a substitute. Uh, in Christian theology, there's a lot of interpretation, uh, allegorical interpretation that's read into this story. Uh, but it's a, it's a very interesting story about Abraham's willingness to even sacrifice his son out of his love for God and his faith in God. Isaac grows up. They need to find a wife for him, so they send to... Uh, their relatives up in Ur, the Chaldees, and Rebecca is brought. Rebecca is a uh, is a, co a distant cousin. She's brought to uh, Canaan, and she and Isaac marry, and they have children. In fact, they have two children, twins. This story is fairly brief in chapter 24 of uh, Genesis, and it serves as a transition from the Abraham and Sarah story to the generation of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah. It gets a little crowded there. Uh, chapter 24 recounts the marriage of the long-awaited son of Abram, Abraham and Sarah to a woman from the country and kindred of the parents. The beginning of the chapter 26 reaffirms the ancestral covenant promise of progeny, land, and blessing for this generation. So Jacob and Esau are born. They're twins. Uh, Esau was born first by uh, you know a minute or two, and he comes out. Jake, as Jacob comes out, he's got his hand on Esau's heel, grasping for, trying to pull him back so he can be first. Jacob is quite a character. He plays a trickster character, and along the way he managed with the connivance of his mother. Uh, Rebecca, he manages to steal Esau's birthright and his blessing. Jacob's mother, uh, Rebecca, colluded with him. He eventually offended Esau to the point that Esau was ready to kill him, uh, at least metaphorically, and so he had to flee to his uncle Laban in the north from his brother Esau in order to avoid being killed. On the way as he's journeying, he lays down and sleeps, and he has a dream of a divine ladder with angels ascending and descending. It was, it's, a, it's a portal, a divine portal. It's a place of access to the divine world. Uh, God gives him, the, uh, God reaffirms the ancestral covenant, and when he wakes up, he names the place Bethel, the house of God. Jacob's time with Laban's family also involves deception, Apparently, it runs in the family, and Laban is an even greater deceiver than Jacob, or at least so it appears in the beginning. Uh, Jacob thinks he's making a deal to work for seven years in exchange for marriage to Rachel, which is the, the beautiful daughter that uh, Jacob has fallen in love with. And But unknowingly to Jacob, Laban tricks him, and on the night of the wedding, it's dark, and he sends in Leah, the older sister, with a veil, undoubtedly. And Jacob doesn't realize that he's sleeping with the wrong sister. And so he wakes up in the morning, uh, surprise, you're married to Leah. So Laban is, tricks him into marrying the older daughter first. He said, but if you work another seven years, I'll give you Rachel also. You can have both daughters. Okay, this is a different culture. A different time, okay? We, we, we established that we're talking about a, across a span of uh, almost 3,000 years here. 
So Jacob works for another seven years, and it says it goes by like a short time because he's so in love with Rachel, he can't wait. Of course, this probably causes some uh, feelings with Leah. Family drama, as I said before. Uh, Laban, so he uh, Jacob manipulates things with uh, Rachel's assistance to become wealthy. He manages to get his flocks to breed more fruitfully than his uncle Laban. So his flocks grow bigger, faster. And uh, it comes to the point where there's tensions. So Jacob uh, flees in the middle of the night with his two wives and his children and his flocks and his servants. Rachel steals her fa father's household gods, which are called teraphim. And uh, apparently this has some association with the uh, idea of familial blessing. So they flee, and they're on their way back to uh, Canaan. And behind Jacob is coming an angry father-in-law with his servants. And ahead of him is coming an angry twin brother with his posse. So he's kind of finds himself now in an impossible situation through his own uh, maneuvering and manipulation. He's put himself in a really difficult spot. And... Uh, he goes out uh, across the stream and decides to pray to God for help after he's done everything he can to prepare. And so he, while he's there by this stream, he has a mysterious encounter with a divine personage, and they wrestle all night. And finally, this uh, ap this uh, appearance of of God or this angel touches his thigh and dislocates it. And says, let me go because morning's coming. And so Jacob says, I will not let you go until you bless me. And so the uh, so God or the, uh, manifest, the manifestation of God says, yeah, I give you a new name. You're no longer Jacob the deceiver. You're now Israel, one who strives with God. So Jacob the trickster comes away from his encounter with a limp a new, and a new name, Israel. And this is the beginning of the peoples of Israel. The encounter with Esau turns out to be peaceful. Uh, the implication, I think, in the scripture seems to be that Esau perceives that Jacob has changed. He's limping. He's, he, he projects humility. And they, um, they embrace and they make peace. Two brothers reconciled. And Jacob goes on with his family to Bethel, which is the scene where he had, had the dream about the... Uh, Jacob's Ladder. And in this section of Genesis, it contains a variety of traditions organized around the question of the future of covenant promise. The story of Sech Sechem and Dinah in chapter 34 is one, one of the interesting stories. Another one is the story of Judah and Tamar in chapter 38. These narrate encounters with the local Canaanite peoples and, and conflicts that could conceivably threaten the family of Jacob and his children. That brings us to the Joseph generation. Joseph is the, uh, I believe he's the 11th son of, of uh, Jacob or Israel. And he's the first son by Rachel. The other sons are by the, uh, by the way, Jacob ends up having four uh, birth mothers or wives, two wives and two concubines. Don't ask me. I don't know exactly the difference between a wife and a concubine uh, in, in terms of the cultural implications. But each of the sisters had their own servant. And uh, I don't know that I'm not going to try to make jokes. OK, I, I'm just not going to do that. So Jacob ended up having children by the two sisters and the sisters were jealous. And so they encouraged their servants to have children with Jacob as well. It was a race to see who could have the most children. And uh, Jacob won the race. So the story takes, this story is, is different than the preceding ancestral narratives. The story takes the form of, no, of a novella or a short novel in which God communicates with the characters in a different way. In the previous sections of Genesis, we recount divine appearances to the patriarchs and the matriarchs, but now God seems to communicate by way of natural processes of life. 
A number of interpreters have also suggested that Joseph is a wisdom character who interprets dreams and perceives the way forward for the future of the divine promise. So Joseph gets sold by his brothers into slavery because they're jealous of him, because the father loves him more than the rest of them. They uh, dip his many-colored coat into the blood of an animal to tell his father that he was killed in an accident. When they see their father's grief, they're, they're stricken with remorse for what they've done. Joseph, in the meantime, gets taken to Egypt as a slave. And there he's serving in the house of Potiphar. And he's blessing, and the house of Potiphar is blessed. But then Potiphar's wife uh, tries to seduce Joseph, and he runs away and gets in trouble and gets sent to prison. And then in prison, he begins to interpret dreams. And eventually, he interprets a dream for Pharaoh that turn, turns out to be prophetic and foretelling about a coming famine. And so uh, he's given favor with Pharaoh, and Pharaoh appoints him to a high administrative position in the uh, administration and it's at that point that uh, Jacob or Israel and his uh, remaining 11 sons including uh, Benjamin the youngest by Rachel ends up coming down some of the sons come down to Egypt to try to buy food because they because of the famine in Canaan and that begins a process of confrontation and family reconciliation that will result in the uh, family of Israel moving to Egypt and becoming enslaved. So in conclusion, the divine promises of progeny, land, and blessing are the uh, themes of Genesis. In the end, Genesis 12 through 50 portrays God, the God of ancient Israel as one who makes and keeps promises and in so doing brings a faith community to fullness of life. The imperfect characters in these narratives represent the human community and its history of learning and tr to trust the divine promise, for therein is lasting hope. The story continues in the book of Exodus, which we will begin to look at next week. Thank you very much. I hope you have a great weekend. It's a pleasure to uh, share this with you, and we'll talk again soon.